Hello, everyone. We are back for the next presentation. Uh, my name is Rodolfo Bellinson. I am a former PhD student in the college at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, now I'm going to uh, introduce you to Dr. Janine Cavender Bears. She's a professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Ecology, Ev Evolution and Behavior. Uh, her research seeks to understand how evolutionary and biogeographic history of organisms influence community assembly, species composition, and hence ecosystem function in the face of global change. Uh, currently, her research group is focused on using remote sensing tools to link above ground functional traits of plants and their research and their, and their diversity to below ground processes as part of a large scale effort to remotely sense biodiversity and ecosystem processes. Uh, Dr. Cavender, are you there? Uh, you, you may start whenever you feel ready. Okay. Are you hearing me? I'm Dr. here. It says okay. screen sharing has failed to start. Okay. If you need any help, you you can just say. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can see. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. This is just a wonderful event and workshop that you've organized and I feel so honored to be invited. Um, I'm gonna to present today on using spectral biology to integrate studies of biodiversity from the tree of life to ecosystems and the potential of this to detect biodiversity ecosystem function and predict plant responses to global change to inform our understanding of biosphere dynamics. And there are a few different parts to the talk. I'm gonna first discuss a project that was funded by the US National Science Foundation and NASA. And that's on linking remotely sensed diversity, optical diversity to genetic, phylogenetic and functional diversity to predict ecosystem processes. And then I'm gonna talk about how taking a clade or lineage based approach to integrating ecology and evolution is really helpful in biodiversity detection. And I'll explain results from a working group through the National Institute of Mathematical Biology and Synthesis on how leaf spectra reveal the evolutionary history of seed plants and why this matters for all kinds of things, including disease detection and effectively managing threats to biodiversity. And then I will brief briefly present the major components of uh, National Science, U.S. National Science Foundation Biology Integration Institute that has been funded to use spectral biology to integrate biodiversity across scales, the study of biodiversity across scales. And I will end with why all of this matters for monitoring biodiversity and managing planet Earth for sustainability. There is a growing interest in monitoring biodiversity using remote sensing technologies and doing this from space. Uh, both US and European space agencies and other space agencies as well are investing huge amounts of uh, funding and energy into biodiversity monitoring from space. And this is, <laughs> really going to revolutionize how we do biodiversity science. But we can't just get signals from space without understanding what they mean. And what we've really been focused on is trying to do the integration between all the ways that we do biodiversity science on the ground, phylogenetics and functional traits and understanding species distributions and interactions of organisms and how we can integrate that kind of understanding of biodiversity to spectral signals that we get from space. And you know, one of the reasons why we really should embrace this <clears throat> idea of remotely sensing biodiversity is because 
really, when we look at it, we, we know an awful lot about a small number of species and very little about most of them. There's a lot of academic research on model plant organisms. There's some on broad diversity and, but we really don't have global understanding of biodiversity and how it's changing. In this paper uh, published in 2016, we, we talked about the, the gap, the tropical temperate gap, and this is a really important forum in which to highlight that. Um, you know, the number of species you have in Brazil um, compared to the number that we have up here in North America, but actually having functional trait information, really good information on the vast diversity of species. Um, and in this case, I'm talking about plant species. We have such a huge gap and, and how do we even start to fill that gap? And so if you listen to, uh, no offense to my friends in the space agencies who fund me, but if you listen to some of the rhetoric, rhetoric coming from space agencies, it sounds like we're going to be able to do all the biology we need with remote sensing from space. And uh, so the question is, is remote sensing the holy grail for biology? And I wanna make the case here, and I think most of you will not need to be convinced of this, that the ground-based work we all do is more critical than ever, but now is really the time to be integrating it with what we can detect from space. And I just want to remind uh, our previous uh, revolutions in biology where we saw technological advances that we thought would be the holy grail, like sequencing the human genome. Without all the other kinds of biomedical understanding, the genome information is really just one more tool. And so that's how I see uh, this tool, uh, <clears throat> hyperspectral information from space and all the other kinds of remote sensing that we can do. They're tools, but they need to be integrated with all the understanding of biology, biodiversity that um, everyone has been talking about in this workshop. So I will start and highlight a few findings of uh, this wonderful project that was funded by the National Science Foundation and NASA to link uh, remotely sensed optical diversity to other kinds of diversity to predict ecosystem processes. And there are a whole host of collaborators, um, some of them shown here, but not all of them. And uh, so John Gammon, Phil Townsend, Sarah Hobby, and, and a whole suite of amazing postdocs like that I will that I will talk about as I go through the research. The premise of the work is that the interaction of light or the, the interaction with energy of energy with vegetation reveals so much about the chemistry structure, functional morphology, and phenotypic variation in plants. And I focus on plants because I'm a plant biologist and they're also the easiest organisms to study using this approach. And that this, this interaction, interaction of light energy with, with vegetation can allow us ultimately to identify species or phylogenetic lineages and thus offers high potential for biodiversity detection across scales. And it also tells us a whole lot about physiology and um, how well plants are doing, whether they're, whether they're stressed, their physiological functions and their, um, their disease status. And so we sought to use remotely sensed spectral information to detect biodiversity in experimental conditions like the long-term biodiversity or biodiv experiment at Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve here in Minnesota. And we work with a number of experimental systems and I'll highlight a, a few of them. We hypothesized that spectral information could give us enough information about ecosystem function and vegetation chemistry and other kinds of variation that we might be able to predict below ground microbial processes and diversity. And for this, we used uh, the Biodiv experiment at Cedar Creek and another experiment, Wood River in Nebraska. 
um, that has larger plot sizes and higher productivity overall and higher diversity overall. We use these two, ex two experiments. Um, in the Cedar Creek biodiversity experiment, uh, Ran Wang showed that within this experiment, spectral diversity predicted alpha diversity well across the experimental plots, but the relationship was much stronger at higher spectral res resolution. So spectral diversity predicted alpha diversity, but it really depended on the spatial resolution. And Hamid Galizadeh showed that in the Wood River in Nebraska experiment where the plot sizes are much bigger, that spectral diversity predicted alpha diversity quite well in this system. And then Anna Schweiger, uh, who was working at Cedar Creek, found that spectral diversity, which was calculated either at the leaf level or at fine spatial resolution using remote sensing, uh, readily predicted productivity. And she thus showed that spectral diversity joins other measures of diversity, taxonomic, functional, phylogenetic diversity in predicting ecosystem function. And Anna uh, developed a series of highly accurate trait models from spectral data at, at the leaf level uh, using partial least squares regression. And these traits, many besides just the ones I'm showing here, could then be mapped. And Shi Hui Wang then mapped these in the Cedar Creek experiment at one meter spatial resolution using airborne imagery. And so we had maps of vegetation chemistry that we could then use to see how well they predict below ground processes. Anna also found that she could accurately classify species based on their leaf level spectra using partial least square discrimination analysis. It's a kind of machine learning. Um, when the classification approach failed, it tended to be close relatives and the confusion was generally among very close relatives. And so this indicates there's likely a very strong phylogenetic signal in the spectra and I'll come back to that. So we were really trying to understand, you know, can we use aerial imagery to get at vegetation chemistry and function, composition and productivity and use that to tell us something about below ground chemistry and productivity and suites of below ground processes. And we predicted that we ought to be able to take information from remotely sensed airborne imagery and then use that to predict organic matter quantity and quality and the processes that regulate microbial diversity and metabolic processes. We also anticipated that the drivers of soil microbial processes would differ between these two experimental systems, the Cedar Creek and Minnesota system on the one hand and the Wood River Nebraska system on the other hand. And in the Cedar Creek BioDiv experiment, we expected the total quantity of inputs to matter most given the relatively low productivity of the system and the high productivity and high <clears throat> uh, uh, the high productivity of the Wood River system. Um, and we expected vegetation chemistry to be a stronger driver of below ground processes in Wood River because here productivity is probably saturating and that makes carbon inputs less limiting. If we look at the composition of species in each experiment in terms of their functional groups, C3 grasses, C4 grasses, forbs, and legumes, both systems show that these functional groups are also phylogenetic groups. So when we think about plant functional groups, we can also think about plant phylogenetic groups. And these different functional phylogenetic groups tend to have different leaf chemistry um, that are shown normalized in these different color squares. The big difference between grasses and forbs. Using a series of structural equation models and bivariate regressions, 
we found that indeed biomass measured as remotely sensed vegetation cover strongly predicts microbial processes and properties, including soil respiration, soil microbial enzyme activity, microbial biomass, net nitrogen mineralization rate, and soil carbon in the BioDiv experiment at Cedar Creek in Minnesota. But in Wood River in Nebraska, biomass did not predict these processes. In Wood River, canopy nitrogen and functional group composition, which was associated with canopy chemistry, predicted these below ground processes and properties. The first example shows how remotely sensed canopy nitrogen predicts below ground processes. And the second example shows that C4 grass abundance, which is associated with canopy cellulose concentration, predicts these processes. I'll move now to a forest diversity experiment. And this one was led by Laura Williams. And um, Oh, it looks like I, I took out the slide that I meant to show you uh, just in the previous experiment that the, the biodiversity, um, predicted biodiversity also predicts below ground fungal community composition and to some extent diversity. Yeah, so this, so move to the, the tree diversity experiment. Um, and this is led by Laura Williams and this is um, in, the IDENT experiment in uh, Minnesota. And it's an experiment with 12 tree species that are grown in um, manipulated plots. And we used aerial imagery to uh, look at the composition, diversity and productivity in this system. And the work I'll show you now, this is the growth of the experimental system over time and the work that Laura did is focused on the fifth and sixth growing seasons. And here is um, <clears throat> hyperspectral imagery represented in th with three bands um, showing the experiment with the different blocks of the experiment where the experiment was repeated in, in, in four different blocks. And you can see an individual plot and then within that individual plot, you can see pixels and in each pixel is um, a spectrum from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. And we had about 0.8 meter uh, pixel resolution. And you'll, you can see in the paper that, sh that should be coming out fairly soon, of uh, the more details. But in this, um, <clears throat> she's looking at monocultures and then mixtures, and so we get we get uh, remotely sensed images of the monocultures and the mixtures. But she's also then um, simulating those mixtures using two different approaches: one in which species abundance is uh, is held evenly distributed across species, and another one, another simulation in which estimated leaf area per species in the upper stratum of the canopy in mixtures is used. And <clears throat> through the, she uses the spectra to do those sim simulations. And um, what she's then comparing is, can you actually detect over yielding or the net biodiversity effect using airborne imagery? And to do this, it requires very accurate models of biomass. So, um, to see if you get more biomass in mixtures than expected from monocultures, you have to actually be able to detect biomass. And she was able to detect biomass quite accurately. And then she, and when she compares the simulated mixtures, the, the spectral simulations of mixtures versus the actually observed mixtures, she sees that spectrally you can detect the net biodiversity effect and it's very tightly correlated with the biodiversity effect that you measure on the ground. So this is really a nice example showing that you can use remote sensing to detect over yielding or the net biodiversity effect, but it does require some assumptions about which species are there, some knowledge about which species are there and um, the abundance of them.
And so we'll get to what she did next, but first I should mention that um, she was trying to get at mechanisms and she's able to very tightly predict nitrogen in the canopy. And that spectrally predicted canopy nitrogen was tightly coupled with field measured stem biomass. And in fact, the mixtures that have greater canopy nitrogen, mixtures tend to have greater canopy nitrogen than predicted from monoculture. And this is one of the mechanisms that helps explain over yielding. So apparently trees and mixtures are pulling more nitrogen out of the ground and, and using it in their canopies for photosynthesis than you'd expect from what monocultures do. And so the interactions of species in mixtures, the diversity effect is allowing them to pull more nutrients out of the ground. And this helps explain the overyielding or the high, higher biodiversity and productivity that we see in diverse systems relative to monoculture systems. And then finally, she wanted to see, can you actually, without any knowledge of who's there, just spectrally detect, build models to spectrally detect the species. And then based on that identification, that identity information, then predict which plots are monocultures, which plots are mixtures and what's in those mixtures and just use those predictions to detect these net biodiversity effects. And indeed she can. Um, without any knowledge of um, species abundances and so forth, using models of which species are which, spectral models that detect individual species, she can predict the net biodiversity effect. It's, the detection itself is not perfect, it's pretty darn good, but there, there are some errors and some of that comes from overtopping of when species are grown in mixtures, some will overtop others and you the airborne imagery can't actually, doesn't enable visualizing the species growing below the canopy. There's also intraspecific variation that, that might show up um, and so forth. And individual pixels might not be pure. They might have multiple species in an individual pixel making uh, it difficult. But despite some of these issues, um, she generally had very high prediction of species identity, composition and diversity in those plots that enabled her to detect the net biodiversity effect, even without prior knowledge of who's planted where and how much of each. So that is really exciting work that if we could scale it up to the globe or to you know landscapes and, and do this at, at many different spatial scales and really get at this question of, do we see net biodiversity effects at larger spatial scales than in, in these smaller plot experiments? and that's a really exciting thing to think about. So I'm now gonna move on to the topic of how model clades like the oaks, which I've spent most of my career studying fairly intensively, can be great starting places for linking spectral tools and remote sensing to the tree of life and for understanding evolutionary processes. The oaks are a really great case study, being they're not an important one because they in here in North America, they are the most woody group, both in the United States and in Mexico, and they also have the most biomass of any woody group. And so they are an ecologically important focal group. They're not only ecologically important and highly diverse, but their evolutionary story is quite compelling. And this is a story which we recently told in an article in Scientific American led by Andrew Hipp and along with Paul Manos. And this built on a series of previous studies by our Oaks of the Americas team with global collaborators, including some of the papers I have shown here. And I think you'll really enjoy this article if you uh, get a hold of it or I can send it to you if you ask me. Uh, I've been studying these oaks for a very long time, including uh, community assembly processes in the southeastern United States. And this image is from Florida oak communities that I've been working on and that I did work on many, many years ago. Um, and what we find not only here in Florida, in, in, in this image in Florida, but also all over United States is that 
each of the major clades occurs in each of the community types. And here in, in the image here, these different lineages are found in each of the different community types of fire dominated, dominated community, two different fire dominated communities and um, a lowland community. Um, you get them each, you get representatives of each of the major lineages occurring in all those communities. And we also see this all over the United States that you get uh, species from different lineages occurring together within communities more often than expected by chance. Um, so here is, here's an image from the study where we use the, the um, forest inventory analysis data from the US Forest Service to look at communities across the continent across, or at least across the United States. And um, <clears throat> this really helps us understand that the ecological dominance of oaks in North America, in the US, is a consequence of their sympatric parallel adaptive radiation. They originated in the Americas at high latitude and diversified within the two major lineages and then in two smaller lineages as they colonized southward, filling up sympatrically and in, parable, and, and in par parallel the available ecological niches as the climate changed and tropical tax had died off. So there was cooling and drying um, that was going on starting some 35 million years ago. And that led to whole shifts in uh, which species could inhabit North America. The tropical tax had died off, opening up ecological space for the oaks. And the major lineages, the red and white oak lineages shown in the middle graphs have nearly identical climatic niches, the axes shown here, temperature, um, precipitation, and the colored symbols are the oaks and the gray are all of the trees in the US Forest Service database. And so you can see the oaks in both of those lineages, the, right, the red oak lineage and the white, uh, the broader white oak lineage, they have nearly identical climatic niches to each other. So that's that's a consequence of this parallel adaptive um, sympatric radiation. Uh, and their functional traits are associated with their climatic niches. If you compare the red and the white oak lineages as I do here on the bottom graphs, they appear to show convergence in their, both their climatic niches or niche axes and in their functional traits. And we formally tested for convergence in function, um, used multivariate analysis of six functional traits using OU models. And we show that the Eastern red and white oaks have converged in this multivariate leaf trait space. Um, they have overlapping leaf functional traits in those two clades. And so we can then examine the phylogenetic properties of leaf spectra, which are getting at all different aspects of phenotype, including functional traits. Um, and we find that large regions of the spectra shown in that middle graph. So this a spectrum is shown on the top graph. That's the reflectance spectrum of an individual leaf. And you can see just a little cross section of a leaf there with, uh, indicating that we're looking at reflectance of that leaf. And then in the middle panel is um, the phylogenetic signal or Blomberg's K value at each wavelength of that spectrum. And for the oaks that we examined grown in a common garden, um, you can see that in parts of the spectrum, especially the short wave infrared, and actually not in the visible region, you get a high phylogenetic signal in the oaks. And then on the bottom graph, you see a suite of different functional traits that we're able to predict from the spectra using um, various trait models like the ones I showed you earlier. Um, and so while individual traits are labile or, or you know, convergent as I just showed you previously, um, or they might also be conserved. Some traits are conserved as shown um, with K values that are close to one. 
spectra in general, and particularly in the shortwave infrared, show strong coupling to the phylogeny. And so on the right is one axis of spectral variation in a principal coordinate analysis, and it shows pretty high fidelity to the phylogeny. So based on this study, which is pretty intriguing for the oaks, we then, um, oh, let me make sure I just explain this part. So we studied the leaf level spectra and found that we even found that spectra could be used to differentiate genotypes of the same species, while standard functional traits could not. They could be used to classify and differentiate species with much higher accuracy than traits that were predicted from the spectra. And this is what's really interesting. We found that spectra could differentiate clades much better than species. So here we are taking advantage of the hierarchical organization of life and the idea that individuals with, within lineages have more shared ancestry and hence are more phenotypically similar. So spectra capture aspects of phenotype in ways that simple traits often don't. And uh, the middle graphs show which wavelengths are important in classification, which is basically nearly all of them well, when we look at which traits are important in classifying species or clades, only a few are. Uh, so given those results for the oaks, um, we set out to do this for uh, across the angiosperm phylogeny. And we assembled a group of amazing and fun colleagues um, through National Institute of Mathematical Biology and Synthesis Working Group um, so we brought together spectral biologists with evolutionary biologists to see what we could learn when we tried a couple spectra and phylogenetic information. This work um, was then led by Dudu Mereles, and sorry that I'm pronouncing his last name not quite right. He's Brazilian and I've, I never have been able to quite pronounce his last name, but this is Dudu. And um, he, this paper has just come out. I think it's still early online. Um, and it's such a wonderful study. Uh, <clears throat> and it shows, demonstrates that spectra are tightly coupled to the tree of life. You can see here, see here the phylogeny of where all the leaf level uh, spectra were collected from and where in the globe they were collected. Um, the many collaborators contributed their data for this. And, uh, there was a lot of difficult work to combine spectra from different sensors that give slightly different types of signals. Um, but what <clears throat> this shows is that the regions of the spectrum that are conserved, that are phylogenetically conserved, depends on which lineage you're in. So there's huge amounts of phylogenetic conservatism, but if you look at the asteroids compared to the gymnosperms, different parts of the, of the spectrum are phylogenetically conserved. And so the upper graph is sort of giving you these major lineages and the bottom graph shows spectra that are color coded based on those lineages and matched to the phylogeny there. Uh, but <clears throat> this, the phylogenetic signal or the Blumberg's K value for a spectra is really quite, quite high across the tree of life. And it means that um, we can use spectra to detect, to detect species identities, or at least to detect phylogenetic identities. If we can't get at species, at least we can get at lineages. And so um, Dudu did a lot of work to fit spectra to evolutionary models, as well as trait models, so radiative transfer models. Uh, as a means to examine how spectra evolved and the extent to which regions of the spectrum and different functional traits are constrained by evolution or, str or show strong convergence. Um, <clears throat> in doing this work, he, this group developed a new framework where the evolutionary model is coupled with a spectral radiative transfer model. And this allowed ancestral leaf attributes to evolve along a phylogenetic tree under a specific model, such that each species ends up with an evolved set of traits. And this can be used to predict spectra that carry the signature of evolution. Um, <clears throat> and I just would encourage you to read this paper because there's just really careful, if you're 
if you're really interested in the evolutionary side of this, the modeling work that Duda did is, is really quite extraordinary coupling uh, these two, two different kinds of models. And here's that paper, uh, leaf reflectance spectra capture the evolutionary history of seed plants. And this work also shows that spectra can classify major lineages. So this is a confusion matrix that shows the, the diagonal shows the classification accuracy and the closer that value is to one, the higher the accuracy. Uh, and this is showing very um, <clears throat> broad lineages, but this also works for family and genera. Um, and there's very high accuracy in using leaf level spectra to detect and identify species. But this also works with airborne imagery over um, a forest, for example. And um, on the right is a similar confusion matrix from Gerard Sapes, and I'll show uh, his work coming up. Um, that shows very high accuracy of identifying individual tree species in the way that Laura Williams did and Anna Schweiger did, but this is for, for tree canopies with airborne imagery. And so again, we have more evidence that spectra can be used for phylogenetic composition detection. And this is really, really important because if we wanna manage planet earth for sustainability, we need to know how biodiversity is changing. And we, know, we need to know what threats are so that we can manage those threats. And this is something that forest managers are really able to do if they know where the threats are and can detect them rapidly um, before diseases and so forth have progressed. And if we can differentiate disease from other kinds of stress factor, factors like drought and so forth. And, you know, diseases, specific diseases, diseases tend to be very, uh, well, they tend to be highly specific to lineages. And so if you can differentiate lineages, that's the first step in actually trying to map threats because you have to know where a threat would even pos be possible. Um, so um, hemlock woolly adelgid or emerald ash borer, or I'll talk about oak wilt in a minute. But all of these are highly specific to, to, to lineages. And so if we can detect the lineages first, then we, we can consider the the, um, the threats to those lineages from pests and pathogens. And so our idea is to, to use remote sensing data to advance species distribution modeling and um, Anna Carnival talked about that this morning, even though I don't understand Portuguese, but I know Anna's work. Um, <laughs> and so uh, that can give us one way of predicting which lineages are where, but we can also directly detect it and once we have a sense of uh, composition, then we can get to the threat detection problem. So we've been working on this for a specific disease, oak wilt, um, in, uh, in the upper Midwest of the United States. And this is, this is our team, it's a wonderful team of um, pathologists, physiologists, remote sensors, and um, this work is being led by Gerard Sapes, who's a, a postdoc. And it takes advantage of the ability to use spectra to both identify species and lineages, as well as to detect physiological change. Oak wilt, it's, um, it's a fungal pathogen, Brettsiella phagocerum. It's really the most lethal threat to oaks in the United States. There's also a sudden oak death on the West Coast, um, which is a different fungal pathogen. But oak wilt is considered the most devastating pest or pathogen of, of the American oaks. And it is actually something that can be managed if it's caught early, if it's detected early. So that's why there's a really keen interest in using these kinds of tools to detect it. So shown in the red are where, where oak wilt has been detected in the United States. And it forms these fungal mats on the stems. Um, in, and it can kill, it's, it can kill trees pretty quickly, but let me 
let me get into that in a minute and I'll just, I'll just give you um, some, an aerial image of what this looks like. This is a drone flight in here in Minnesota, at Cedar Creek Ecosystem Science Reserve. We can see these, um, these dead trees, it forms these pockets um, and it spreads through the root system. So the fungus actually spreads between grafted roots below ground. If you can catch it, you can sever, you can, you can, um, create trenches that sever the root systems and keep it from spreading, but you have to know where it is and you have to catch it early. And uh, the point I wanna make now is that even within a single genus, phylogenetic information is important for threat detection because lineages within the oaks have different susceptibility. And so here we're looking at stem cross section. This is the xylem. The fungus grows up from the roots through the xylem and it, it blocks the xylem, but it, um, the immune system of a particular lineage may be good or bad at blocking off that fungal pathogen. And so this, this compartmentalization is something that some lineages are good at and others are not so that they can block where the fungus is affected infected and keep the other parts healthy, but some lineages are not good at that. And um, within a vessel, some lineages are good at uh, detecting the fungal infection right away and blocking it with tyloses so that it prevents further spread and others are really inadequate and they, they can't detect, they don't sense it and then well, and then they form all kinds of tyloses that don't really stop it and they end up blocking their own xylem with their own defense response and um, causing blocking the flow of water and causing their own wilt. And so the white oak lineage tends to be pretty resistant. It gets infected, but it's able to compartmentalize and to block fungal infection. So it can live for a very long time, even with the infection. Whereas red oaks will die within one to two years because they're ineffective. Their immune systems are ineffective at blocking the pathogen. And so even being able to differentiate the red oak lineage from the white oak lineage turns out to be really important in first identifying where these threats uh, have the potential to occur. Um, you know, <clears throat> there are really millions of dollars at stake in, in doing this because oaks are so important and abundant in, in the US and this disease is also spreading to Canada. So here's red oaks, which this is an example of rapid death in red oak with the ineffective immune system. And then white oak that you can see might have a sick branch, but it's able to compartmentalize that and uh, it, it has a more effective immune system that can block an individual vessel pretty effectively and pretty quickly so that the tree can maintain function. So we used airborne imagery and we had a, a number of marked trees with known identities and we used as, uh, these are map trees and we were able to use these and others to build models to detect species based on airborne imagery. And so we can then use that, that imagery to detect the probability of oak wilt infection and um, disease. Um, and we used <clears throat> imagery from different aircraft, the Avarice, NASA flew Avarice imagery, but we also had Asa Eagle imagery flown by the Calumet um, Airborne uh, Group in Nebraska. And so as I've been mentioning, the detection accuracy is influenced by classifying trees first. If we can actually know, if we can first identify which lineage, this might help us um, to detect, get a more accurate model of disease detection. So in this analysis from Gerard Sapes, he first determines if a tree is an oak or not, and then determines whether it is in the red or white oak clade, given that oak wilt is much more deadly in red oaks than white oaks. And then the final step is determining whether a red oak is healthy or diseased. And by using this process, rather than a one-step discrimination analysis, he's able to get a much improved oak wilt uh, 
detection pipeline. And he can give uh, a <coughs> very detailed um, presentation on this, but I'm just gonna show you um, a quick overview. So first uh, we're detecting oaks versus non-oaks and we have pretty high accuracy doing that. And then within the oaks, we try to differentiate red oaks from white oaks and we have pretty high accuracy doing that. And then once we're, we know we're looking at the red oaks, we, we have really high accuracy of differentiating healthy and infected trees. And I mentioned that we're using different sensors in, um, <clears throat> from different flights led by different groups. And some sensors go from about um, 400 to 1100 nanometers and they get the visible and near infrared. And the NASA Avaris Next Gen sensor also includes the shortwave infrared. So we wanted to see how well we could what, how much that mattered to have the shortwave infrared. And also to compare when we use just direct detection, a single step model versus this multi-step model where we detect the species and lineage first. And with direct detection, just using the VNIR sensor, we have pretty low accuracy when detecting diseased individuals. If we use the VNIR plus, plus SWIR, we get higher accuracy, but it's it's still not that great. But when we use the phylogenetic approach where we detect oaks and then red oaks first and then try to differentiate disease from healthy, we get much higher accuracy and, um, <clears throat> and it's improved with having the shortwave infrared, but the big difference is really using this phylogenetic model. So Gerard has then also been doing experimental work where we inoculate some of the we inoculate seedlings and then look at physiological progression of the disease. And I'm just going to show this very briefly, but in controls, you know, looking at suites of traits related to water content, water potential, quantum yield of photosynthesis. And then when they are treated with oak wilt, those physiological traits decline. And some of the variation you see here is also dependent on precipitation uh, immediately before the measurement. Um, and then you can find the specific wavelengths that are really related features that are related to those physiological traits. And he's done a whole series of models that I'm not showing to predict specific physiological traits that are associated with disease decline, physiological decline due to the disease. But here I'm just showing that the same wavelengths that you measure at the leaf level, canopy level, landscape level, and we think even at satellite level, those same wavelengths when we do simulations at, even at the satellite level, differentiate healthy and oak wilt plants. Um, and, and these wavelengths are related to either photosynthesis or water potential or water content, uh, or sugar content, things like that. And we're able to see these same features at all of these different scales that get to the physiological processes that are changing with disease. And so that gives us hope that we will be able to have a mechanistic understanding that enables detection at the regional scale that's informed by the uh, work we're doing at the landscape tree level and leaf level. And so um, I'm going to move now in the final portion of this talk, I'm gonna briefly explain the goals and themes of by a new biology integration institute that the NSF National Science Foundation has just recommended for funding. They just announced it today. And it's based on these concepts using spectral biology. And the institute is focused on understanding the causes and consequences of plant biodiversity across scales in a rapidly changing world. And this is our team. I'm directing the institute uh, with Phil Townsend, Peter Reich, who are co-directors. So this is this is centered at the University of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin Madison, but we're also partnering with um, the University of Zurich and the Canadian Airborne Biodiversity Observatory, and we have collaborators at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Oak Ridge National Laboratory, University of Maine, 
and other places. And so this is our this is our team. There's a lot of out engagement, outreach, education involved in this. We have a really amazing advisory board and we'd really like to develop collaborations with you folks. Um, we really hope this can be an international effort. And so at a time when we are confronting multiple global crises, biodiversity loss and climate change are major global changes that are not going away and they threaten our very life support systems. In our view, integrating our knowledge of life's diversity from metabolites to biomes and the causes and consequences of its change for the biological processes that impact our well being has never been more important. So, we're really asking how and why life's variation at the smallest scales influences variation at all other scales, and how global change influences biological variation at all of these scales. We're really seeking to do this biological integration and, and change how we do biology, focusing on plants and vegetation, using the tools of spectral biology that have really only now become fathomable to apply across scales from cells to continents. Um, we're using platforms like NEON, the, <clears throat> the National Ecological Observatory Network in the US and emerging global uh, forthcoming hyperspectral satellites like the Surface Biology Geology Mission that's forthcoming from NASA and CHIME, the European Space Agency and other, uh, other satellites to quantify building blocks of life at every biological scale using the same currency, the reflectance of photons from the sun from vegetation. And we wanna use process oriented predictive models to allow us to advance theory to understand processes by which variation at one scale influences the next. So our conceptual framework is to designed to investigate how components of biological diversity at every biological scale interact with the environment through a series of processes to give rise to emergent properties that we can spectrally detect at the next scale of organization. And each of our five themes, five themes spans two biological scales from genes and molecules to whole plants, the tree of life, communities, ecosystems, and landscapes in the biosphere. And we are advancing theory and using process oriented models to understand the causes and consequences of biodiversity. In theme one, and I'll just go through these really quickly. We start with the genetic variation and the small molecules that form the fundamental building blocks of variation within individual species to understand gene expression, plasticity, and selection resulting from organism interactions with the environment. And this provides a mechanistic understanding of within species spectral variation. In theme two, we then examine the evolution of spectra across the tree of life in relation to past environmental changes. In theme three, we examine the spectral and functional variation of species from across the tree of life and how their interactions and assembly processes could give rise to neighborhoods and communities. Theme four, we study the, the consequences of species interactions for ecosystem function and local biogeochemical cycles. And finally, we examine how biodiversity and ecosystems and landscapes across the globe give rise to biosphere dynamics. I, some of this thinking has come through large scale collaborations, which uh, some of which have been published recently in this book that we did on remote sensing of plant biodiversity. It's all open access. You can download any of this for free. Um, and you can find this on our website, spectralbiology.org. And I'm just gonna close by saying why I actually care about this so much. Um, I spent uh, three years as a coordinating lead author in the International Panel on Biodiversity Platform, Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And I was part of the Americas team. Um, so this was covering all of North America, Mesoamerica, the Caribbean and South America. And we were tasked with assessing trends in the diversity um, 
<clears throat> in diversity and ecosystem function. And when we looked for the data to actually do this properly so that we could communicate to policymakers how things were changing, it was really hard to get consistent data across all of the subregions and to, to access data. And in many places, as I'm sure you're well aware, it was just the data don't exist. And we we were tasked with getting trends in all in a whole series of uh, indicators or um, factors associated with biodiversity. And in the end, we couldn't do it consistently across subregions. So we ended up having these panels of experts and basically getting expert opinion to establish the trends for all the different biomes within each subregion on how habitats were changing in different biomes. And the, the dots that you see there are the confidence levels. So we shouldn't be, in, <laughs> In the 21st century, we should not be using expert opinion to document trends. We really need global data on biodiversity and um, detection from space is a really good way to get that data if we can understand it and integrate it with all the kinds of work that biologists have been doing on the ground to get this kind of information so we can monitor biodiversity and ecosystem function on planet earth and know what's happening and know what, if policy changes are actually making a difference, we need to be able to detect that. And being able to monitor is really critical to being able to manage. And so a number of folks have been working towards a global biodiversity monitoring system that would really integrate remote sensing tools and um, in situ uh, measurements of biodiversity. And Geobon uh, has really taken the lead on this for a number of years and it's coming to a point now where this is soon going to be possible and i so i have a lot of optimism about this approach as long as we stick with the need to integrate and really understand mechanistic basis for spectral variation we detect from space and so i'll just leave you with my final thoughts which is that there is enormous potential and need for remote sensing and biodiversity assessment and risk assessment. And this kind of monitoring that we should be able to do is critical to managing biodiversity and planet Earth for sustainability. But remote sensing is not gonna fill all gaps. It's not the holy grail. We have to keep doing the work that we're doing, but now integrate this other kind of, of knowing about, about biology and biodiversity. This, we really, this is a critical tool that we need to start integrating now. Um, we need to make sure we know what we're measuring, it's uncertainty, and what it tells us at the temporal and spatial scale focus. There are all kinds of issues that have to do with spatial resolution and time point at which we do our observations. And so um, I just want to convince you that we really need to integrate biological, ecological expertise with remote sensing, not replace it. And so with that, I will... Um, be really glad to answer questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Cavender Bears. We are really glad to have watched this interesting talk. Um, we do have a few questions for you. Uh, first one is from Daisy Marcella Angarita Ospina. Uh, have you ever studied how different soil compounds influence the reception of remote signals? Mm. You mean like the directly detecting soil chemistry? Is that what you're saying? I guess so. I'm yeah, not so sure. <laughs> I, I think that quite a bit of that has been done and um, that's actually not the approach we've been taking. We've actually been developing mechanistic models for how we think vegetation chemistry should influence the low ground park processes through root chemistry, root exudates and litter decomposition. So that's the approach we've been taking, a more ecological approach, but it is actually hyperspectral technology has been used for quite a while to detect uh, chemical composition of surfaces. And that's actually what they do on other planets and so forth to figure out what's there. So yes, that should be possible. Okay. 
Uh, next question is from Juan Andres Martinez Lanfranco. Uh, very interesting, thank you. How remote sensing could serve as a proxy for multiple facets of diversity in hyperdiverse tro tropical forests, where there is very complex, complex vertical stratification of species, as in high canopy species obliterating the detection of mistrata and understory species. In other words, would what you presented work equally well in the forest tropics or in tropical forests? Yeah, so I actually don't want to be evangelical about this and try to convince you that this is going to work for everything. That's actually not my goal. Um, I just think it is really powerful information that will tell you a lot about your system, but it might not work in exactly the same way that we do in our low diversity temperate systems. And you know, Greg Asner has been doing this work in the tropics for quite some time. And there's a large group of folks that are that are working in these complex systems. It will definitely tell you a lot about function and chemistry. And those functional traits are really critical to understanding ecological processes. It'll tell you quite a bit about function, biomass, all kinds of things, complexity. And then you can combine other types of remote sensing like um, LIDAR methods that are getting at structure and can get at the structural complexity. And um, this can be coupled with radar measurements and other types of measurements. But again, I don't want to say that remote sensing is gonna get at all that, but it is gonna get at a lot more than we currently can without it. And so, um, I think the approach we've been taking is to really embrace the new information we get from it and try to understand it. And it's good to point out the limitations because it isn't going to do everything. And that's why I say it's not the Holy Grail, but it gives so much broader coverage than we've ever been able to get before. And with this hyperspectral satellites going up, um, and the Jedi mission that's been on the international space station that gets its structure. There's so much more we can do now that we've never done before that um, I think it's really the moment to embrace what we can get from that. Okay, uh, next question is from Mauricio Umberto Vancini. At a time like this, when the Amazon rainforest and Pantanal is on fire, how could this approach help us to understand this diversity loss? Well, see, that's where time series are really important. Mm -hmm. So if you have time series of imagery, I mean, you, you can first capture where the fires are, but that's, you know, that is, that is being done um, as we speak. Um, but it, yeah, looking at time series, change through time, change detection, that's a really important approach for looking at biodiversity change. And if you can interpret the signals that you're getting, the spectral signals that you're getting. So this, the satellites that um, are planned should have a 30 meter pixel resolution. And so you're gonna get a community, you'll get like, you know, if you're doing forests, you'll get multiple canopies in a single pixel. So you'll get, I mean, <laughs> You could then fuse that data with higher special spatial resolution data, like planet data or uh, worldview data. There are things you can do to get higher resolution data, or you can simply say, we know something, we know a lot about the functional traits and composition and productivity of this system in a 30 meter, at 30 meter spatial resolution. And now after the fire, it looks really different. And you can track that through time, you can track the recovery, you can see how the composition changes, chemistry changes through time. That kind of thing I think is so doable and so important to do. And that was the kind of information we were looking for in the IPBES assessment. Um, so I think this will really revolutionize that, our ability to address that kind of question. Okay. Uh, next question is again from Juan Andres Martinez Lanfranco. Could this technology be used to detect if the American chestnut trees are still standing that were uh, that were once mostly all wiped due to another fungus? Similarly, yeah. could yeah, there, there's a, a follow-up on the question. <laughs> Similarly, 
Could this also help to ma uh, in the management of the pine beetle infestation in boreal forests in the USA and Canada? Yeah, those are great examples. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, of course. Yeah, because you can definitely detect chestnut with this. Um, you can develop models. There's so much information in the spectrum. It's like hundreds of bands, hundreds of wavelengths. It, it gives you this, you know, it's really in a, a way of seeing your eye has basically three bands. Think of hundreds of bands. It's so much information to, to detect um, a species and chestnut is really distinct from everything else. I mean, it's not gonna be confused with an oak. Um, they sh at a high enough spatial resolution, it should be it should be very possible to do that, and it might even be possible at the at the lower spatial resolution. Um, it just takes some time and effort to figure out these approaches. Like, do you have to use data fusion approaches, or can you see when there is a chestnut in a larger in a community that's got a lot of other species in it, and you've got a mixed pixel, or do you you know which way does it work? So it takes work to do that but it, it's surely possible. And that's a really, really good question. And in terms of the, the pine um, beetle infestation, I, I think people are already doing this. Um, I mean, I outlined how this, our approach is for oak well, but the very similar thing can be done for these other diseases, uh, pathogen pest outbreaks um, and, and surely will be done. And, um, yeah, absolutely. Cool, great answer. Um, next question is from Cassia Pitincourt. Which traits could be linked linked to remote sensing on mountain landscapes or rocky grasslands, where plant species are defined uh, where plant species are defined as edaphic species? Hmm, interesting. So, we do have a project in Chile in the high in, in the Andes. This is with Mary Kaylin Arroyo, who actually met through the IPBES process. We were co-leads on our chapter of Across the Americas, and she's from Chile. Um, and we've actually been finding that the trait models that we developed in on plants here in Minnesota, North America, work pretty darn well on those plant species in Chile, even though they're totally different species. Um, they change a little bit, but... Uh, those, you know, detecting chemistry in plants really is relying on the same features in the spectrum, regardless of the species. And um, yeah, I, I think that there, I'm now forgetting the question a little bit, but um, yeah, it should be very possible to do that. I, I, I don't see a reason why it, it wouldn't work. Um, you, you, want, you want me to repeat the question? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Which traits could be linked to remote sensing on mountain landscapes where plant species are defined as edaphic species? That's, that's the question. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, all the same functional traits like nitrogen, carbon, carbon fractions, you know, lignin and cellulose, hemicellulose, pigment concentrations, um, all these kinds of traits can, should be readily detected. It's going to depend on spatial resolution, though, right? Because um, my my limited experience in high elevation systems, there's a lot of area. There's a lot of bare ground, especially above the tree line. And if you've got mixed pixels of, of like bare ground and vegetation, I think that poses a complication that you have to f you get the right methods to deal with that. Um, so yeah, it might be a spatial resolution issue more than anything else, but the, but the spectra should readily detect a whole suite of functional traits, leaf mass per area and water content, water potential um, and so forth. Sugar okay. content, yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Fernanda Vernac. Great talk, Janine, thanks. Congrats on the grant. <laughs> Lots of more cool work to come. <laughs> that was just a comment. <laughs> and another question from Tiago Gonçalves Souza. Thank you for your amazing, your amazing presentation. I'd like to ask whether spectral diversity could have a bottom-up effect on carnivores. 
Whether spectral diversity could have a bottom-up effect on carnivores. Yeah. Um, okay, you have to unpack that question for me a little bit. But, I mean, I think spectral diversity is itself a complicated term. What does it mean? It really depends on the spatial resolution, and it might depend on the temporal the, the time point and the temporal resolution you're measuring it at too. So spectral, you know, we found in systems that have bare ground, spectral diversity is really getting at heterogeneity in vegetation and bare ground. But when you get finer spatial resolution, then your spectral diversity is really getting it. It's very highly correlated with species diversity, phylogenetic diversity. Um, and so the, the spatial resolution you use is really important for getting a measure of spectral diversity that actually reflects plant diversity. But the extent to which you can um, get bottom up of effects from plant diversity for herbivores, spectral diversity will give you the same thing if you measure it at the right spatial resolution. Does that answer your question? Well, <laughs> it's not my question. So <laughs> we'll get some feedback and <laughs> we'll probably know it. <laughs> Uh, next question is from Diogo Provecci. You mentioned at least two projects that are open for collaboration. How, how people interested could start collaborating with you? Um, well, we have to figure that out because this is day one. Like literally the grant just got announced today. Um, and so I would encourage you to just contact me and you can also, I put up a really quick website, spectrobiology.org. Um, and you can take a look at that. Um, I think there's a place in there you can put an email, but I, I will set it up so that you can contact us. And you can contact me. Is my email available somewhere? Cavender at umn.edu. You can email me, just Google me and you'll find my email address. Um, and let's figure it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we have another question from Anya Susan Streher. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Anya. I'm sorry if I'm not. Uh, how does leaf phenology and demography affect trait estimation from spectra and, and scalabil scalability? I think that's it. Now that is a very deep question. Okay, so you know, it's some really nice work that John Gammon's group has been doing on um, looking at spectral changes throughout the season. And Anna Schweiger did some really nice work while she was working with us. And she's been working with the Canadian Airborne Biodiversity Observatory, and they're looking at changes across the season too. And in the Nimbus working group we did, people had contributed spectra from different points in the season. Um, and some things change quite a lot, like pigment concentration. But there are aspects of morphology and structure that don't change that are picked up in the shortwave infrared. Um, and so you can actually still detect species at any point in the season. Um, you can still get those major lineages pretty well at different points in the season because the morphology is not changing. But the pigments, of course, are changing as you know, you've got a fresh leaf that's that's still that's not yet autotrophic, and then you know, it's still relying on stored carbon and then you get a maturing leaf that's fully functional and then you get a senescing leaf and that changes the spectrum quite a bit, but there's still some things that are not changing. Um, and now I'm forgetting the question again. <laughs> uh, scaling uh, up, how does that influence yeah, yeah. scaling up? Um, I mean, I think if you have imagery across time, I, that is such a big question. How do you scale up? That is a, that is that is like a whole can of worms. How do you scale up? Um, and that's that's actually one thing we're really trying to get at is to what extent is the variation that you see at the smallest scales, the spectral variation you see at this scale of an individual leaf, how does that inform us about the variation that you see within a community or landscape or when you are actually using spectral information that you want to put into um, earth system models. Does what we learn at the, the genomic basis of variation at the leaf level, does that inform us about the variation we see at the, at the highest, the largest scale? Um, 
And I think in terms of variation that occurs with phonology across the season, a lot of those things will have the, the same mechanistic basis. So variation in pigments that, you, that are largely coming from the visible region, that sh those should be very similar at the leaf level and the whole biome level. Um, so some of these traits are highly sca scalable and then other things there's so much variation and there's so much of the spectral variation that's coming from structure and the structure, structural variation is gonna shift so much when you go from a leaf to a community and a landscape and so forth. And so I think some of those features are not gonna be scalable. Okay, last question for you <laughs> uh, from Pedro Sena. Thank you for your nice and informative talk. Uh, how much of on ground effort do you think it is necessary to validate spectral data? Do you think it is possible to, ap <clears throat> to apply spectral information in areas that were historically historically less sampled? Historic, historically less what? Sampled. Sampled, oh, yeah. well, yeah. that's the hope, right? Because it, these, these functional trait models do seem to be pretty general and people are applying them. So Phil Townsend has been working with um, JPL to apply functional trait models to get ready to apply functional trait models to surface biology and geology mission data that uh, 30 meter pixel, uh, 30 meter resolution hyperspectral satellite that NASA is putting up in probably 2027. And the idea is that the models that we get from leaves and ecosystems should work all across the globe and um, we, he, this group, this larger group of people have been testing these models across many, many different species from all parts of the world. And they seem to be pretty generalizable. So I think, yes, I think that will be possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much again for being here with us today. It was a great talk and I, I am sure everybody learned a lot from your talk and well, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, what a wonderful thing you've done in the middle of this very strange time. Okay. <laughs> Take care, <laughs> everybody. You. Stay well. <laughs> you too. Uh, okay, let, let me just see if, if we have announcements to make now. Uh, I think that's it. We We... We are done for today, but we will we will, <clears throat> we will come back tomorrow at 8.30 again for a talk by, if I remember well, by Cecile Helen Albert, if I am pronouncing it properly. Um, I think Tiago has something to say now for us. Sure. Bom pessoal, é isso. Muito obrigado por acompanharem o workshop hoje novamente e nós voltamos amanhã de novo às oito e meia com a próxima palestra. Uh, acho que o Tiago Gonçalves tem, é, tem alguns, alguns anúncios para fazer sobre o formulário que ele mencionou anteriormente. É, só um momentinho que ele já está já tá chegando aqui. Em alguns minutos o Tiago vai voltar aqui para fazer os anúncios sobre o formulário. Bom, até amanhã e muito obrigado pela participação novamente. <risos>